What is up, you guys? It's me, your girl, you Casey. How you doing? I cannot find a flattering light angle in this room. I feel so washed out and white. So maybe all the books in the background will just help like distract from my glistening face. Not gonna lie, reading in October and November was, n was not fun because I was dealing with NaNoWriMo, which it did not go well. And also I read this one book and you know what it is. I already did a review for it. Go check it out. Better Together by Christine Riccio. Yeah, that book nearly killed me. Or at least the creative parts of me. It sucked them right out. So I had been in a reading slump for a while, but what always gets me out of a reading slump is reading thrillers. They're like my palate cleanser book. There's no intense world building. They're not like 800 pages. They're short, sweet, not a lot of descriptions to the point, and they make me cry. They make me scared. I love thrillers because they are real life horrors. They're stuff that every single one of us can actually live through and that makes them terrifying. So here's another two thriller book reviews. I'm going to do the one I really like first and the one I didn't really like next. Starting off we have The Therapist by B.A. Paris. I do not like this cover but it's a four star book to me. I feel like it's a four star book like particularly for me. Like I don't think a lot of people think it's a four star. Maybe around like a three because it's a very character driven book and usually thrillers are like that especially the domestic ones where it's just like oh I heard um some creaking in my hallway at night nothing really intense going on besides gathering clues and solving what the heck is going on around them but let me tell you about my author B.A. Paris when I first started reading the genre I started off with The Wife Between Us and Anonymous Girl all great books but the third book I picked up was um Behind Closed Doors by B.A. Paris. In that book, wow. I wasn't fond on how it ended. I thought it was kind of anticlimactic, but the whole book, like before that, was great. It was terrifying. Also, another part of thrillers that I like is, okay, if I'm in this character situation, how am I gonna escape? But in Behind Closed Doors, I couldn't figure out how to escape the situation. Like, the, our main character was done for. Like, yeah, she gone. So I had a really good introduction to B.A. Paris. I read her other books, The Breakdown, which I DNF'd because I it only had like three characters in it. So I was able early on to guess who the villain was. And I can't remember her second book. I think it was Never Let Me Go. No, Bring Me Back. I think it's Bring Me Back. That one was fine. I was so close to guessing the twist. Like I was always like right behind the twist. And I didn't really get close to any of the characters in that book, but it was an enjoyable ride. So me and B.A. Paris, we had good standing with each other. And what we have here in The Therapist, our main character, Alice, she's an extreme ex extrovert who works at home and she's from the countryside. She likes the quiet but she also wants to get out and meet people and eventually she does. She meets this guy named Leo and they head it off. Leo's like, hey baby, why don't you come move in with me? I got a swanky new house in the city. She's like, oh, this is going to be a difficult move because I love my house. I don't really want to sell it. But okay, Leo, I like you more than my house. And so Alice moves in with Leo. Brand new house. Alice, she wants to get to know everybody in the community. It's a really tight knit community. It's called The Circle because it's a circle. Like all the houses are facing each other. So there's no real sense of privacy. One of the side characters that I really liked in this book, I think his name was either Jim or Tim. He's a like a psychiatrist kind of, I can't remember the exact name for it, but his job is like examining people, watching people, learning about people. So I like how the character, or at least how Jim is just like always standing by his window and he's like always looking out at all the neighbors and no one thinks it's creepy. They're like, oh, that's just Jim or Tim. That's just what he does. But Alice, she wants to get to know all these people. So she has a little party, some drinks, maybe a charcuterie board if you're, you're getting real fancy. But an intruder trespasses on to the party which sets off this whole chain of reaction and it eventually is revealed that before Alice and Leah moved in there was a different girl a whole different couple living in there before them the wife was a therapist and she was gruesomely murdered in that house by apparently her husband and Leo Alice's boyfriend he knew this and did not tell his lady love because he knows she wouldn't like it but the house was like a good price yo and so there's a whole like ethical question raised in this book like would you buy a house if you knew someone was recently murdered in it as opposed to someone who was murdered in a house 200 years ago someone who died peacefully in the house which is interesting to think about but anyways Alice she's not happy with Leo no and because she's not happy with him like she's not paying attention to him anymore because she's got all these conflicted feelings like why do why you lie to me like that I told you right from the beginning my biggest thing of about a relationship is that we have to have trust but 
get this, our girl Alice, she had a family. She had a family. They all died. Her sister who died, her name was Nora. And the therapist who lived in the house before Alice did, her name was Nora too. No relation to sister Nora. And so Alice is like, oh my gosh, like that's my sister's name. I feel like I'm kind of connected to this lady. So she digs into the mystery a bit. Like what really happened? And like all my neighbors, like their neighbor died in her own house. What do they know about it? She digs more and more into the case and she begins to realize that the situation surrounding it is a little bit sketch. Things aren't adding up and now it's up for our super sleuth to figure out what happened to Nora. I'm not going to talk about spoilers yet because I do want to talk about the twist in this book and the villain and everything and like that. But this book can easily be seen as a very slow book. It's just our girl Alice talking to neighbors. Sometimes like, you know, forwarding the plot and like ask, being, asking them the hard questions like, where were you the night of October blah blah blah. Or it's like just a hair discussion like, oh girl, that hair? Mm. Fire. But it's stuff like that that I really like. I love when characters act like humans and they actually like have these little meaningless discussions. It's very human of them. Plot wise and thrill wise, like, well, we have a good plot. We're gonna find out what really happened to old therapist Nora. Our girl Alice, she's like, she's picking up all the clues along the way. Sometimes she gets a little bit too crazy. Even I'm like, girl, that's impossible. Like, what you're, how you think? Nora died is literally impossible. <laughs> but the main attraction of A Throw It To Me is just like suspense all throughout the book. This book has a lot of, oh, I think there's someone in the house with me suspense. But to me, that's not very suspenseful. I mean, in real life, that would freak me out. But in a book, I'm like, okay, yeah, it's a, it's a creaking floorboard. You're fine. Stuff like that didn't keep my attention. But I was like really interested in the thriller part, the mystery, what happened to Nora. Was her husband really the one that killed her? And yes, I was able to guess who the villain was. There's a big red herring in this book and he's a big scarlet shade of red it's so obvious it isn't him because of how obvious it is him but there was like an added twist in this book at the very end that I did not see coming so it kind of like erased the disappointment of guessing the villain because this new part was like ooh. Ooh, I really like that. So yeah, the twists and the characters are really good. I really sympathize with Alice because she's carrying this grief from her family. And like whenever she meets a girl named Nora, she's automatically like instantly like caring for her, wants to be her best friend. Cause she like equates that person to her deceased sister. And she doesn't have closure over that. Alice has a really good friend group and they're trying to like get her to move on. Like not forget her sister, but to accept that it's in the past and that she can't hold on to this fascination. I liked meeting all the names neighbors in the circle. They all had like really interesting jobs. And as I mentioned before, all their really human uh, conversations. They talked like real people and they were really interesting to get to know. So it's a four star for me. I really wish it had more moments besides, oh, I think someone might be in the house with me. I want more concrete things. Like instead of just hearing a noise, I want our girl to see like a shadow go running past her doorway. Like, ooh, I got chills just like thinking about that. Cause like I said, I'm very paranoid about people being in my house. So yes, if you want a nice, gripping character driven thriller that's not too intense like you might want to sleep at night but still has a very good end to it then this is a good one for you i highly highly recommend ba paris's um behind closed doors if you want to freak out but i want to talk about some spoiler parts of this book real quick if you don't want to hear about spoilers go ahead and skip to the next book i'm going to do that book's a one star so you know it, it might get a little spicy up in there but we're going to talk about spoilers for a couple minutes now so you guys know spoiler fam people who've read this book who just don't care to read this book but still just like giving me talk for some reason yo weirdos <laughs> like this voice it's an annoying voice <laughs> you know how our private investigator guy he shows up to the party and immediately our girl's like oh are you um jim or tim i can't remember his name i could easily look it up but i'm not <laughs> and immediately the guy's like oh yeah i'm jim no ma'am no you gave him all the information right there you gave him a name and he could just snatch that up he could be bob not jim and now he's all in your house drinking your lemonade that right there's instantly like this guy is a fake he's bad news but then like further on down the road you learn he's a private investigator and he seemed like a really nice guy i liked him for a little bit because he was funny he actually made me laugh because like my name is 
Tom. And Alice is like, well, I thought you said your name was Tim. He's like, I never said that. And you can't prove in a court of law that I didn't say my name is Tom or Tim. They're the same name, just different vowels. I liked him at that moment because that sounded like something I would say. I work in customer service and my name is Casey. Or is it Kaylee? Or Katie? Or Cassie? Kaylee? If I don't want these people knowing my name, I can give them a fake name. Be like, oh, my name's Kaylee. How can I help you today? And then if I do something wrong or they just don't like my face, they can complain to my manager be like, oh, that Kaylee girl? Piece of trash. Man, we don't know a Kaylee. I have bamboozled them. So I related to Tim Tom in that moment. But yeah, later on, it eventually became clear that this guy is the murderer. Private investigator Tom. The main thing that like alarm bells, that set off alarm bells was because none of the neighbors of the circle ever saw this guy coming into her, Alice's apartment, walking up the driveway. So I always knew he had to be close by at all times because it's kind of impossible in this place. Oh, look, my light died. Like my hopes and dreams. <laughs> I'm blinking the spots out of my eyes real quick. Hold on. Yeah, it's impossible for this guy to go unnoticed to this girl's house. And he's like, oh, I came through the uh, the password gate. And we know he didn't do that. He was a fantastic liar, though. Good on him. And also, I really liked the um, past parts of this book. You know how we have the present timeline and then the past, which is from the therapist's point of view. I knew, um, per, like, listening to the past therapist, like how they're talking in their head, thinking. And what we know of therapist Nora these people weren't the same person. Nora was too kind. Like, yeah, people could believe she's kind. She could be a total not kind person. But from the start, I'm just like, these two characters aren't the same characters. And also the therapist's point of view was in first person, which is a good way to hide the pronouns. So we don't know if it's a he or a she. Felt so bad for Nora's husband in this book though. Poor guy. Like, you get framed for murder and you kill yourself. That, that's just mean. And so later on, oh, well first, I couldn't believe that Alice was like pointing the blame finger at the real estate agent in this book. Like, he, he hasn't been in this book at all. Maybe he said like one paragraph of dialogue, but she's like, no, he did it. I'm like, girl, you got no evidence for that. You are reaching hard. So everything in that moment was like, yeah, it's the private investigator. Oh, look, it's the private investigator, just like I thought. But then the twist I didn't see coming was that uh, Edward and Lorna, I think, were his parents and they'd been held captive this entire time. That blew my mind. It made me want to go back and reread this book just just to see what Edward and Lorna were doing this whole time. Because I knew they were suspicious because they kept dropping those cryptic hints to Alice. But I also like an idiot just kept forgetting while reading this book that they dropped those hints. Like, don't trust anyone, Alice. Oh, be careful who you talk to. Like, I would just straight up forget that they said that. But yeah, how... Alice runs from her apartment to Edward's and Lorna's because she trusts them the most out of everyone. And she opens the door and Edward's just, no, not Edward, uh, private investigator Tom is just standing right there like, hey baby, welcome to my house, meet my parents. That freaked me out. That was a really good one. Those poor sweet elderly people. Edward died. What? His son's a jerk. So I love that part. And can I mention the hair fetish in this book real quick? Is it just me or did that kind of come out of nowhere? Like, we're just reading the book, chilling, chilling. Then, um, Tamsin, that other girl, and Alice are just, like, sitting at a kitchen table talking to each other. And for, like, three pages, they're just talking about their hair. And I'm like, so hair... Because I believe that if something's mentioned for a long time in the book, it's going to play a really important factor. So now I'm like, okay, so we have like, hair is going to be somewhat important in this book for some reason. And then yes, revealed that private investigator Tom has a hair fetish. And eventually Alice does have that. She finds that fake ponytail in her cabinet. Weird. But it was mentioned like when we had like a maybe 150 pages left. So way past the middle part of the thriller. And I think now that I'm thinking about it, that the book did a good job subtly building up to it by mentioning how Alice thought her hair was falling out and how she had a past history of her hair falling out. And I was noticing that so much. I'm like, okay, so I thought for a little bit that the murderer was another woman. Cause I'm like, I don't think this is Alice's hair that she's finding everywhere. I'm thinking it's someone who has similar hair to Alice. But then I couldn't re ever remember what all the girl characters in the book, what their hair was besides Tamsin. I know she's a redhead. And one of the other characters had like white hair with like pink or purple tips. Thinking back on it now, did it come out of nowhere? Probably not. But reading it, it 
felt like it did. A happy Lorna stabbed her awful son in the back with scissors like a billion times. That was great. Highly recommend. Good job. So I had a ton of fun with that book. But now I want to talk about a book that has a lot of the same elements as The Therapist, but doesn't pull it off as well. It's called Such a Quiet Place. Did I pick this book up just because it reminds me of A Quiet Place? Yes. This is by Megan Miranda, brand new author to me. Now this book has a really interesting setup. I gave it a one star though, so the setup's the primary part that I like. Maybe the only part. What we have here is a sleepy little small subdivision, you know, really close-knit neighbors who are way too invested in each other's lives. And they all have, you know, security cameras on their porch. If you make one wrong move, you're gonna get your screenshot posted on the community message board. Like, Rebecca, you double parked again. But what you don't know about this town is that there was a resident there named Ruby. There was also, right next door to Ruby, a couple, and there were a couple that no one in the neighborhood really liked. But that don't matter now, because that couple's dead. Someone had snuck into their house, disabled their carbon monoxide alarm, turned on their car with the garage door shut, and just let the two, like, officiate. Aficiate. Aficiate. I think that's how you talk. Yeah. And all the evidence, which we gotta talk about how this evidence was collected in the first place, but all the evidence pointed to Ruby killing the couple. And yeah, jury found her guilty. She spent like 14 months in jail, but the ruling was overturned. They're like, hey, this investigation has been tainted from the very beginning and we cannot try her. We can't judge her. So they let Ruby free. Where does she go to? She goes right back to the neighborhood to our main girl, Harper, who was her roommate. The roommate living in the house next to the house where the couple was killed. Maybe or maybe not be by Ruby. Maybe not be. That's grammar right there. Harper is our main protagonist. She does not have a personality really. She's just like, she's been binoculars. She is for us to just pick up and look into the story with. Like, honestly, I can't think of a, I don't know what she likes. I don't know what her favorite color is. I don't know what she dresses like. She's just air. Like, she's there, but do you really know it's there? No. But Harper, anyway, she is not thrilled that Ruby is back. She doesn't really believe that Ruby actually killed those two, but she doesn't think she's innocent too. And none of the other neighbors are happy that Ruby's back either. They're trying like all these little sneaky subtle ways on how to like make her feel like ostracized, make her leave, try to kick her out of the neighborhood. But Ruby's like, uh -uh, I'm staying right here. I'm gonna make all of y'all uncomfortable as I'm lounging out on my beach chair at the community pool. I don't care what you think. And Ruby is also dead set on finding like who set her up to like take the fall for for this murder that happened. Yeah, she's about to dig some dirt up, people. She's about to expose all your nasty little secrets. I kinda wish this book had been in Ruby's point of view versus Harper's. That would have made it a lot more interesting, but also kinda impossible. I'll discuss why later on. So this is another, like, neighborhood book. Like, all, all of us together, all of us have our own little secrets. But rather than giving people personality and just making them interesting to get to know, like the therapist did, and each of these books had a big cast of characters to keep track of, which makes it harder to guess who the villain is, except I knew who the villain was in The Therapist. But I didn't know who the villain was in Such a Quiet Place, because like all the characters, so many of them were spread so thin, I couldn't remember them. And so when the villain was revealed, I'm like, I don't care. And I don't even get your logic, villain. Oh yeah, and that evidence, like there's a police officer who lives in the neighborhood and the two, the couple were killed and Mr. Police Officer's like, okay y'all, let's gather up our evidence. So instead of like turning over all of the footage from their security camera, these neighbors, these Karens, they were just, they were allowed to just send snippets of the videos to the police. Like, oh, here's a two second clip of Ruby walking past my house at midnight. They were allowed to just send in screenshots basically versus the entire footage, which just blows my mind. This book, besides me not getting to like any of the characters, it really does have a dragging, it, it drags, it doesn't have a good pace. A dragging drag, <laughs> words. Again, it's more of that, oh, there's someone in my house creepiness, which does not hit me well. It doesn't affect me. There's an interesting turn of events that happens like 200 pages in, and it is interesting. It turns like um what we know that's happening in the book upside down for a bit, because now we have two murders to think about. Technically three, but that, that's 200 pages into the book, and now we just, suddenly have another 
cool event that happened since the beginning of the book, which was, oh, who murdered this couple? That's a long time to keep my interest, and it didn't do that well. Just talking spoiler-free, there's not a lot for me to discuss about, besides what I've already mentioned. There is a friendship in this book between Harper and this girl named Tate. Now, I think in the beginning of the book it's built up like, oh, they used to be good friends, but they had a falling out. Ruby had a part to play in the falling out. But it's mentioned so little, and we see so little of Tate, that I forgot this friendship even existed. And it's kind of like rebuilt all of a sudden, like, oh, now we're besties again. So that kind of came out of nowhere. I did not like the villain's motives. I didn't, un there's a lot of teenage affairs happening in this book, and I just did not understand it. There is also a character at a pool party and he's talking to some other character and he's being a jerk he's being a little snobbish a little i know something you don't and he's like well did you know that your partner was i'm um, cheating on you now he said that but the way he said that it was like i had no idea what he was talking about like he was saying words and i did not know what he was saying like he was just trying to say your partner cheated on you but he packed it into so much filler that the meaning got lost with me. And I didn't know what the heck he was saying until our character reacted to what he was saying. So yeah, the dialogue was not the best part in this book then. It lagged, I didn't like the pacing. I do like how Thoreau's described neighborhoods though. Like they feel real, they feel Claim. I can hear the clamor of like kids outside my windows when I'm reading thrillers. They're very good at making me feel like they're there and this book did make me feel like I'm there at their community pool party with them. But I just wish I wanted to be there. I'm going to talk about some spoilers now so if you don't want to hear it this is probably the good time to click off of the video. What I did like learning about in this book was that the original murder of the two couple, the two couple, the one couple that no one in the neighborhood liked, it's revealed that no one murdered them. It was just an accident. Ruby was innocent the whole time. I really, really like that. No complaints there. That's like, it's, it's kind of, I can see that happening in real life, especially in our era. Like a lot of us are in a true crime. We think we know everything. We try to solve our own mysteries. And it's this misinformation that can really hurt someone else. I can see that happening to someone. And then Ruby, poor innocent Ruby, even though she is kind of a jerk, but I like her. Um, she gets murdered, anti-freeze in her beverage at the pool party. Yeah, all these people just partying, looking at the fireworks, and there's a corpse on a lounge chair like five feet away from them, and they just don't know. Like, they are ignoring this girl so much that they don't know she's dead. It was kind of unclear to me whether they all hated Ruby enough to kind of set her up or at least like fabricate evidence framing her for the murder or if it was all just circumstantial and like oh I saw Ruby going out of her house at midnight and that's what like led them to accuse her of the murder whether it was accidental just like a misunderstanding or whether they're like we need a scapegoat because we're all hiding something too like our own little secrets on our security footage so we're gonna blame Ruby. Talking about the villain now, it's Charlotte, the mega Karen. I mean, out of all the people, I would have guessed it was her if I knew her more, because she just had that like authoritarian, dictatorish feel to her. Like everything must be perfect on my cul-de-sac. <laughs> but I didn't get to know her that well. Like she was always just in and out, and there were so many characters, and they weren't handled well. So I'm like, I don't know how to react to you, lady. I don't get her motivations that well either. Like I get the premise, the most basic stuff of her motives for killing uh, Ruby, but I don't really understand it. So Charlotte thinks, I think, I could be wrong with this, because this book, again, was just not good with dialogue or explaining. Charlotte thinks that her two dollar dollars, <laughs> I have two dollars in my pocket, she thinks her two daughters, uh, Molly and Whitney, I think, had a hand in the couple's death. So she's trying to like keep people away from that. Like, oh no, it was, it was Ruby, it was Ruby. Ruby comes back and now Charlotte sees Ruby as a threat to her daughters. So she kills Ruby. That was just a really big leap for me. Like, is this one girl really so much of a threat? Legally, she has been cleared. Like, she is innocent. But Charlotte's like, oh no, she's guilty. Oh, no, it can't be my daughter's. So it has to be Ruby. Let me murder her. <laughs> Again, I really liked how it was revealed that the original murder was completely an accident. That was fantastic. I really liked it. And I loved how just the message board was used in this book. Like, texts, emails, messages, diary entries. I typically love those in the book. They're good 
good way to like give the reader information but also like just take a break from the pacing too. So besides the use of the message board which only happened like five or six times, the original murder not being a murder, Ruby being innocent this whole time, those were the only like three things I liked about this book. I couldn't get to know any of the side characters. It's, it's really bad that I didn't even know our main character Harper. There were way too many characters to keep up with and they just did not have the personality to keep up with them. I could understand some of the motives for the neighbors for hiding the security footage but I couldn't understand Charlotte's motive. It was just way too too much for me I guess about the proper build up. And y'all that is it for me. Tell me what is the latest thriller you've read. I've realized that I have not read Gone Girl at all. Seen the movie. It's a movie right? I don't even know what the book's about and that's like the most popular thriller ever and I need to fix that. So I have one more thriller from the library. One of Us is Lying. I'm gonna finish that. And I'm gonna get Gone Girl. What are you gonna plan on reading? Thank you guys so much for watching and stay reading my friends.